Well, welcome everyone. I love that video. It always reminds me of the strength of what's possible within a very motivated community. I'm Mark Millam. I'm with the Flight Safety Foundation and I'm MC of our virtual Bass 2020 webinar. And we've got four sessions planned over the next two days. You know, I wish we could have been joined together under one roof today, but we're glad you've joined us on this virtual Bass 2020, despite the conditions we are in across the globe. Perhaps your involvement says a lot about the resilience of the business aviation community, because I think it does. I'll give a little bit more advice when I come back later uh, to give you what you need to know about our event today and to engage with our speakers and moderators. But to get us launched today, I would like to introduce the Flight Safety Foundation's President and CEO, Dr. Hassan Shahidi. Hassan. Uh, thank you, Mark. Greetings and welcome to BASS 2020 and a special greeting and welcome to Flight Safety Foundation members around the world. I hope everyone is safe and remains healthy as we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. We can get through this together and we will prevail. You know, um, as many of you know, this year's BASS was originally scheduled to be held in Savannah, Georgia, and it was canceled due to COVID-19. But BASS has been continuously held since 1955, and we didn't want to make history by completely canceling this year's event. Instead, with the great help of the Business Advisory Committee, we have transformed it to a virtual event. The work of safety must continue, and we hope that you will find it useful. This summit is organized in partnership with NBAA and has served as a safety forum for the business aviation community for many decades with a singular mission, identify safety concerns, devise approaches to reduce risks, and implement initiatives to improve safety. This year, we have oriented the program to address some of the issues relating to COVID-19. At this point, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, FAA Administrator Steve Dixon. Steve was sworn in as the FAA Administrator in August of 2019, after being confirmed for a five-year term by the U.S. Senate. Steve has had a long and distinguished aviation career, first in the U.S. Air Force and later at Delta Airlines as line pilot and many other roles, finishing up his career as Senior Vice President of Global Flight Operations before retiring from Delta. Steve has been a strong advocate for aviation safety, a leader in government industry collaboration as exemplified by his dedicated engagement on multiple industry stakeholder groups and advisory committees. He has been a longtime friend of the Flight Safety Foundation and it's great to have him kick off BAS 2020 for us. So at this point, please uh, join me in welcoming FAA Administrator Steve Dixon. Good morning, Hassan. Thank you for uh, for that very kind introduction. Um, and I want to thank uh, the Flight Safety Foundation uh, and NBAA uh, for the opportunity to be uh, with you today and participate in this important virtual uh, aviation safety summit. Well, um, Steve, uh, uh, you know, um, first of all, welcome to BASS 2020. And, and you know, you promised to be our uh, uh, keynote speaker in Savannah. Uh, in fact, on this day, at this hour, uh, we were supposed to be in Savannah. And we thank you, given your busy schedule, that you have kept your promise to be here with us virtually. Absolutely. No, could, couldn't be happier to be here. And, uh, you know, it's been, uh, as for all of us, it's been, uh, I would say, a very unique environment the last, uh, you know, six weeks in particular. And uh, it, it is uh, breathtaking to think how quickly the world has changed. It really and is. Something that we all you know, need to have, continue to have a dialogue about. So um, you know, I would have preferred to be with you all in Savannah uh, as we had originally planned, as you said, but coming together virtually is the next best thing. And we're certainly doing a lot of that here at the agency 
uh, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, I think uh, my record for Zoom meetings in one day is 12. Uh, so, uh, so it's uh, it's it's definitely uh, an environment, but it it also creates a lot of opportunities uh, for I us. If so. We look at it. In so the I'm going to leave you for a few minutes for your some opening remarks, and I'll join you in a little bit. Okay, thank you, Hassan. Again, everyone, thanks for taking the time this morning. It's a pleasure to to spend the time with you, and I'm encouraged that we're finding new ways uh, to collaborate uh, in the midst of this crisis that has. Uh, really uh, disrupted and certainly changed so much of our personal and professional lives. But it's important that we uh, keep uh, finding ways to collaborate and move forward together. Uh, we can't let our guard down on safety, especially in the COVID-19 era. Um, and as Hassan said, you know, my background is in commercial aviation and also in the military. Uh, I was at Delta for uh, 27 years and an Air Force fighter pilot for about 11 years before that. But I never saw anything like this. Um, you know, we uh, pandemics were something I remember reading about in the history books. I remember reading about Spanish flu at the end of World War One, and uh, but never thought that we would be confronting something like this. Uh, from my airline career, you know, we navigated through uh, a number of uh, of crises uh, like SARS, uh, MERS, H1N1, and Ebola but nothing on this scale, of course. And what we're seeing currently, uh, you know, and if you go back to early March, um, you know, the, the, what happened to the aviation system really had not uh, taken, taken effect uh, in terms of drops in capacity and, uh, and, and air traffic that we have seen really in the, in the past uh, five weeks. Uh, April has been, uh, much worse as we've seen uh, the airlines and general aviation, business aviation really draw down in ways that, that I think none of us uh, would have ever contemplated. By March 31st, the average reduction in passenger capacity was about 50% from originally planned schedules, which was about 3% uh, growth. Um, in the U.S., of course, I watched the daily traffic reports and uh, our National Airspace System Performance. Uh, it's the first thing I look at every morning. And uh, by the 20th of March, so just to sort of put things in perspective here, uh, by the 20th of March, uh, traffic in the airspace, now not passenger volume, but, but actually airplanes flying, uh, had dropped about 20%. Um, and we were seeing much more significant drops by that time in Europe, more in the range of about 70%. But 20% uh, drop by the, by the 20th of March. Four days later, uh, we saw declines uh, in the range of 37%. And by the end of March, uh, you know, it was uh, really about a 50% drop. Uh, and now by mid-April, we've settled in at about 68 to, to 70, 71% on a daily basis. But TSA passenger volumes down more than 90% and, and pushing 95 in some cases. Um, something else that, that, uh, that you don't think about is the disproportionate uh, decline in business travel on uh, the commercial carriers. And that's reflected in the New York market. Of course, we all know that New York is the busiest aviation market in the world. Well, right now it actually ranks as number 11 in terms of passenger volume. I mean, just think about that. Uh, LaGuardia in particular on a, on a weekday this time of year normally averages about 1,100 operations a day. And uh, this morning it was, uh, or actually yesterday it was 57. And we've even seen some days uh, down in the 40s uh, when you get into the weekends. So just, just a, a order of magnitude of uh, change that we have not seen. And uh, the near complete shutdown uh, of the world's passenger aviation network is, is really unprecedented. COVID-19 is also a stark reminder that the flight crew of the 21st century is an integral part of, uh, of a highly complex and interconnected transportation network. It's an incredibly safe, efficient, and environmentally friendly global network. But as we've seen in the last 60 days, uh, and as I said a minute ago, it can come to a grinding halt in a, in a hurry. 
So where do we go from here? What happens next? What will the new normal look like? Well, we don't know exactly, but uh, I think a couple of things are certain from my perspective. And the first one is that we have to keep the national airspace system safety op safely operating. We're on the front line for delivering supplies and moving first responders uh, where they're most needed. Uh, and that has been a huge focus of us at the agency is to keep the system uh, operating. And, and we are open for business and, uh, and we're operating normally. Um, the second thing is we've got to continue our vital safety work. Um, forums like this are extremely important. That now includes preparing for when the world uh, and its citizens return to airports to pick up where they left off. And we'll talk uh, more about that uh, a little bit later. Um, but as I also said a minute ago, out of this crisis, we're seeing some opportunities to work in, in different ways. And, uh, you know, I've always thought that, uh, that, that these, these uh, challenges that we go through uh, in our work and in aviation actually uh, create opportunities to look at uh, issues that we deal with all the time uh, in, in different and creative ways. One of the opportunities that we're now leveraging, of course, is, is what we're doing today, coming together uh, virtually. Um, I recently, uh, personal experience, I took part in a video uh, compendium of leaders and uh, celebrities at the 2020 graduation at the US Air Force Academy that the Vice President spoke at. You may have seen that covered. It was a very uh, unique event. And uh, the video was the idea of the graduating class who faced with the first virtual graduation in the history of the Academy, created their own customized ceremony that included cameos from, from uh, people like myself as a 1979 graduate. So I think uh, the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention, that's definitely what we're seeing. There's nothing like a crisis to see just how inventive uh, we can be. At the FAA, we've had a number of very important events postponed over the past month or so. Uh, one of them, being our uh, Aviation Safety InfoShare event, uh, our Commercial Aviation Safety Team, uh, the General Aviation Joint Safety Team. Uh, so we too have to have had to find ways to innovate and show our creativity to continue making progress. Our Mission Support Services Group, which is part of our air traffic organization, held its first virtual safety risk management panel on the government version of the Zoom platform recently. And that's not easy for a, a big government agency like the FAA, but we did it. Uh, the topic of the two-day panel was ASDX and also ADSB at uh, Salt Lake City International Airport. The participants, including the FAA, airlines, and airports, were able to identify some risks associated with controller and vehicle driver situational awareness that we can begin addressing and developing solutions for right now. Um, and you might say that the FAA is zooming into the future. Uh, believe it or not, and this happened really in our first week uh, when we went into more of a telework posture, we're right now doing about 1,500 Zoom meetings uh, per day. And, uh, you know, I'll typically, uh, I mentioned before, I think my personal record is 12, um, and the day has a little different, different cadence. Uh, the work has expanded. Not that it ever isn't seven days a week, but it's definitely expanded because uh, we've had uh, some challenging things that we've had to work on to serve uh, the aviation industry and the, and the American public. Um, and we're continuing to solve issues uh, that we can't address in person and problems that the industry is encountering uh, right now uh, because of these extraordinary circumstances. And I'm very proud of, of what we've been able to do here in, uh, in Washington in the National Capital Region and the District of Columbia, we're working together in different ways that we didn't think about so much before. And, and some of this we'll hold on to uh, even with, uh, with the new normal after the, this portion of the crisis is over. And I'll give you an example. I've got 34 locations here uh, in the vicinity of our headquarters. And uh, you know I've got folks over at LaFont Plaza, for example. And, uh, uh, a lot of times we'll have, uh, you know, meetings or events during the day uh, where I have to make decisions or, or engage uh, people on my leadership team or subject matter experts, and they may come over here for a 30-minute meeting, uh, 
uh, with me and uh, or or others on the on the leadership team in terms of keeping things moving and making decisions. And uh, you, Zoom is not something that we had ever really uh, thought about, you know, in that type of day to day work environment. You think about the just the transit time, uh, just uh, getting getting to and from. Uh, that maybe we can take some advantage of these uh, of these technologies, and that's you know. So we're going to be changing some of our our work practices even after uh, uh, this crisis is over. Um, we're th so we're thinking about the future, but we're also firmly rooted uh, in the needs of the present. And as I said a few minutes ago, keeping the national airspace system operating safely, and operators flying in the midst of a public health emergency. I want to share a few examples of how the government and the FAA are supporting industry needs. For starters, our air traffic organization has continued to provide air traffic services that enable air transport of vital people and cargo. And we facilitate the repatriation of more than 70,000 US citizens on more than 700 flights from more than 120 countries. And I'm very proud of the work that we've been able to do together uh, with FEMA and other federal agencies to to keep the supply chains moving, uh, getting healthcare workers and personal protective equipment moving to where it's needed most. Um, everyone here knows the fastest way to do that is through aviation. Things that always traveled by boat historically now need the need of aviation to get, uh, get the supplies and the people where they're needed most. We're also providing timely regulatory relief and guides to the aviation industry, including business aviation. Um, We've already rolled out uh, more than uh, 30 regulatory relief items. And actually uh, today, I'll be signing a, a special federal aviation regulation that will uh, bring another uh, two dozen uh, items to the fore that I think uh, a lot of you will be very, very interested in. Uh, and that took uh, a lot of work uh, in the middle of the night and uh, interagency coordination process that uh, that our team has has undertaken uh, to get all those things across the goal line. We provided limited relief from certain Part 135 regulations on the timeframes for completing recurrent training and qualification requirements for ground personnel and pilots, flight attendants, check pilots, and Part 135 flight instructors. We've also granted limited relief from Part 135 regulations to allow certificate holders to use alternative methods to conduct certain required crew member emergency procedures during recurrent and upgrade training, testing, and checking. And of course, we produced and updated uh, safety alerts for operators on crew health and air carrier guidance to make sure that protective measures keep pace with the changing risk environment. And as, as you know, from following the daily reporting, uh, we keep learning more and more about this virus, and uh, and so there, therefore we've got to continue to uh, to update the guidance out there for all of our operators and all of our people. Uh, we worked uh, with interagency partners to exempt crew from health screening to enable continued operational efficiency and minimize crew exposure to passengers. And we continue to stay engaged in, in state and local government efforts to restrict flight operations into airports so that we can make sure vital air transport services are not disrupted. Now, not related to COVID-19, we yesterday published guidance that allows Part 135 operators to use the standardized training provided by Part 142 training centers. This groundbreaking effort is the culmination of more than four years of collaboration with the aviation industry through the Air Carrier Training Aviation Rulemaking Committee. By developing a model that works for operators of all sizes, we improve safety by enhancing consistency. And it doesn't end there. We're still listening to you to see how else we might be able to help while maintaining a consistent level of safety. And you've got my word on that. Earlier, we talked a lot about the new reality of virtual meetings, but we also know there will always be a need for face-to-face. -face. After all, that's one of the main reasons that our business has become foundational to the world economy. These personal face-to-face uh, -face relationships are extremely important. So as aviation rises again, and it will, we have to be ready. To help make sure we're ready, 
the agency is planning a series of virtual safety town hall meetings that will start in May. Uh, the first will be a part 121 safety town hall meeting we'll host on May 7th to discuss common challenges that we're facing during this unprecedented public health emergency, as well as how we should best prepare for the eventual resumption of demand for passenger travel commercially. We're gonna follow that uh, shortly thereafter with a general aviation safety town hall with similar goals. Now, a key part of the part 121 meeting will be a new commercial aviation safety team or CAST initiative to identify potential hazards posed by COVID-19 to the US aviation system. That information will be shared with all domestic stakeholders and other civil aviation authorities as we discuss this global challenge. For the General Aviation Safety Town Hall, we'll work with the GA Joint Steering Committee to identify issues that they are seeing in operations or issues that concern them as we get back into the air. Some of the topics we plan to include are things like preparing pilots to begin flying again uh, once operations begin to return to normal keeping aircraft in airworthy condition with reduced operations, infrastructure concerns during and after airport closures, fuel and maintenance availability, and stress on pilots and their families due to the health crisis and, uh, and concerns about um, health and family. So we look forward to your participation with us in these events and for your collaboration and support uh, in general as we face some new safety challenges together. And as always, if we work together, we collaborate, we can overcome the obstacles. Uh, we'll overcome and we'll remain the gold standard in the US for aviation safety globally. So again, thanks to the Flight Safety Foundation, to NBAA for your kind Thank invitation you. uh, and for all of your, everything that you do to promote aviation safety in the world. And thank you to everyone for attending today. And I'm looking forward to uh, some, uh, I think, some constructive dialogue uh, with my good friend Hassan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Steve. And uh, goodness, that that's uh, yeah, that's a lot of um, effort and activity just just in the last two months. It's just unbelievable. Those numbers that you mentioned in terms of operations very sobering, as well as the efforts that it, that's that are happening um, to really um, enable. Uh, safety, continue to enhance safety and, and provide relief to the various segments of the uh, industry. So uh, congratulations on that, Steve. Happy to serve. Um, I thought uh, we spent uh, some time on a kind of a fireside chat conversation on just follow up on some of the things you mentioned that are of great interest to our audience today for sure. Uh, I wanted to start out with um, the guidance on training centers that was just announced yesterday. Um, I think the orders in the AC were signed last week. That, that is significant, I think, undertaking by the community. Um, and it really does um, enhance safety by standardize, standardizing uh, training. So it's, it's, it's been a long way in the making. Um, and I was wondering, is this the type of um, uh, format in terms of collaboration, you'll be encouraging more in the future to try to achieve these kinds of things? Absolutely. And I, I think, uh, again, you know, not associated with, uh, with the crisis itself, but I think it's a good example of how work has continued, um, you know, in this, in this environment. And uh, we want to continue to collaborate. We've got to find uh, opportunities uh, for us to, uh, to be more effective. Um, I, I certainly think that uh, we've got to take advantage of these opportunities, but we've also got to uh, mitigate the fact that we haven't been able to come together in the kinds of forums that we're used to, uh, like CAST and um, like InfoShare, and uh, you know, and 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 Bass. You know, frankly, the the uh, so I look, we look, we all look forward to. Those types of of, uh, uh, of opportunities to engage again, but we've got to continue to work on uh, what we've committed to. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do uh, with uh, FA reauthorization uh, that we're continuing to move on. We've got a lot of work to do on on initiatives uh, like this, and uh, we want to know what those opportunities are to work more effectively together 
um, and create uh, opportunities that make sense for the industry uh, as we move forward. I think, as you point out, this is a good example of that. Uh, Steve, there, there are a couple of questions um, really important to certainly the bass and the uh, business aviation and general aviation community um, with respect to access. So the FAA uh, announced recently some adjustments or reductions really to operations at about 100 air traffic control towers. So as you can imagine, this is of great interest. Um, and I was wondering, what is now the process moving forward um, timeline and process to bring back, you know, eventually to normal operations? What, what, what are the processes or, or the, the thinking behind that? Well, this is, uh, uh, thank you for asking that question. This is part of uh, the resiliency, uh, resilience plan, if you will, uh, for the for the current uh, crisis. And uh, let me go back just a little bit. This was sort of the, I would say, this is probably the sixth or seventh uh, step that we've taken to make sure that um, the national airspace can, can, can continue to operate. And coming into the, uh, the COVID crisis, you know, for the really since early January, the agency had been involved in working on a lot of the international travel restrictions uh, and trying to be a voice of reason and also to facilitate conversations uh, that would not be, uh, so that the outcomes would not be disruptive uh, to the aviation system and really coming at it from an aviation safety perspective. Once the virus became, uh, come into uh, the United States, then we had to certainly um, look after the health of our own workforce and, uh, and how our own contingency and operational continuity plans, which are very robust, um, but they didn't really contemplate disruptions to facilities and the workforce at the same time, and also the level of variability that we would see. For example, uh, our facility redundancy uh, measures at the larger airports, for example, usually rely on a backup tower. Or if we lost Potomac TRACON here in, uh, in the national capital region, their contingency plan, for example, if there were a tornado or a, or a uh, technology outage, the plan was they would relocate to Washington Center and, that, and they would operate out of that. So those, we've got over 300 air traffic facilities, uh, 314, I think, around the country. And, uh, and the, um, our, our contingency plans were set up for redundancy around those. And um, so coming into the, you know, coming into March, we were executing and prepared to, uh, uh, to have those uh, contingency plans put in place. For example, during big events, as you see at a lot of companies, we, we went on a technology uh, and a maintenance mor moratorium. We do this during the, during the Super Bowl. So we didn't want to have a lot of uh, upgrades going on in the facilities where systems might get disrupted, or we would have uh, technicians working in close proximity without social distancing with controllers. So those things were already in place. Um, the difficulties that we had in the early going we had a shutdown at Midway Tower and Las Vegas Tower and a portion of Indianapolis Center and, uh, and New York Center uh, where we were out of commission with, with chunks of airspace or tower facilities in some cases for several days. And uh, so we had to get our arms around, how are we gonna get the workforce uh, you know, back in, in operation and how are we gonna remediate the facility in terms of cleaning and making sure that it's a safe place for people to come back to work. And uh, I learned a lot about cleaning contracts that the FAA has um, and supplies. As you know, uh, supplies of personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies, hand sanitizer, you know, that, that had been a challenge. And uh, we found that some of our procurement where we had tried to procure supplies, we had things in the pipeline that ended up getting repurposed for healthcare uh, Professionals. And so we had things that we thought had been ordered and, uh, and they didn't show up, you know, at our, at our facilities. And this was, this was really in the, 
in the early to mid-March timeframe as everything was really starting to ramp up. So uh, we worked very closely with, uh, and it's amazing how quickly this happened. We had a great partnership with uh, our unions, with NATCA in particular, and, uh, and with PASS. And we were able to put protocols in place so that once traffic uh, declined, I mentioned it had declined in the last two weeks of March from about you know pretty flat year over year around the 10th of March to a 20% decline by mid-month to 27% by the 25th and 50%. Once we dropped below about a third, that created the opportunity for us to essentially redo the air traffic controller schedules and we were able to create formed crews and essentially put them on a five on, 10 off schedule so that if we lost a crew in a facility, and we had to put folks in quarantine because they had been in close contact with each other because they're not, you know, they're working scopes. Uh, traffic had been brought, brought down to the point where we could manage the entire system as if it was late at night or early in the morning. We just weren't seeing the same kinds of peaks in the operation because of what the air carriers had drawn down. So we were able to keep, create these reserve, reserve pools of controllers. The next step beyond that is what you just asked about. And uh, because this, this had the, the effect of, it improved the resilience of the system because we always had a fresh uh, crew. We created sterile areas within our facilities as well. So for example, out at Potomac, Tracon, and even out at the FAA Command Center in Virginia, uh, we were able to set up sterile operational work areas by repurposing conference rooms and administrative areas pulling into data and displays into those areas so that if we had to shut a facility down for a few hours to clean it, that we would still be able to run the operation. Uh, so it, it was a, a two-pronged attack there. With the uh, challenges with supplies and also our workforce, we then moved to our lower activity facilities. And th these are the, there were actually 117 towers that we originally looked at. And when we looked at demand, there was so little demand um, at these airports in terms of traffic that we looked at opportunities to adjust the operating hours and essentially uh, more people, uh, you know, out of the physical workplace on a day-to-day -day basis, still working, but maybe on, uh, on uh, less frequently and uh, still be able to provide full service because typically a lot of these uh, airports will be closed on the back side of the clock anyway. And so there's a, there's a local approach control uh, or other facility that can actually handle the traffic during those periods of time. So it was, all, it was very data driven. Um, we also looked at the reason we went from 117 down to 93 is that we worked with the community, we worked with the airports, we worked with the Department of Defense. Uh, we looked at things like, uh, we made sure that we had pilot controlled lighting you know, at these, at these airports. Uh, so as we worked through all of those other issues, uh, there were other factors that came in that, that made us think, okay, we won't actually do these 117. It, the final number ended up being, uh, I think it ended up being 93. And we'll continue to, vit, to, to uh, review the data uh, as we go forward, as traffic starts to pick back up. And as there a need, we'll certainly expand those operating hours um, back uh, to where they need to be. But we'll always be able to provide full service because these are all areas that have uh, an overlapping uh, radar facility um, associated with them. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for that explanation. It sounds like a comprehensive uh, review and assessment, um, and it's it's continuing. Um, switching to, to another uh, comment you made in your opening remarks about the, the, the guidance on health. The FAA issued this uh, occupational health and safety guidance to air carrier and crew. Um, I think it was sometime in March, um, and it was labeled inform. Um, so it looks like this is going to be fluid based on what we're learning about the virus and what the medical community is uh, finding out. Um, what's, what is the strategy moving forward in terms of incorporating the medical community new findings and guidance and how will this then change the, the FAA guidance maybe coming forward? 
Well, it's, it's a great question. And uh, the most recent uh, CDC guidance, which we updated, I think on April 17th or thereabouts, uh, that's, that's the third iteration. And if you remember, and these things happen in some ways, it seems like, you know, six months or a year ago, but uh, actually a lot's happened in a very short period of time uh, because the, the emphasis early on was on containing the virus through travel restrictions and, you know, managing uh, uh, aircraft coming in and out of, out of the U.S. So the first guidance was really around uh, a lot around air carrier protocols and crew protocols so that we didn't have flight crews getting put into 14 day quarantine and that, that we wouldn't have the, uh, the carriers or individual crew members uh, disrupted, you know, as they were trying to continue with, uh, with commerce and with the movement, particularly the movement of supplies, uh, you know, at, at that time. And, and that continues to this day. So a lot of the initial health guidance was focused on international uh, protocols. As, uh, as we continued, there was a subsequent update. And then the most recent guidance is really about best practices in terms of um, uh, crew health, as, as more has been learned about, in particular, asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic uh, transmission. And, uh, and this has created uh, some, I mean, you can see it in the, in the daily uh, reports you know, that, that we see, things that were looked at even outside aviation as culturally maybe even unacceptable three weeks ago are now actually enablers potentially to getting the economy going again. Um, you know, the, if you went into a grocery store a month ago and saw somebody with a, with a mask or a face covering on, um, you know, typically in the U.S., you know, that was the exception rather than the rule. And, it, and there was a thought of, of, well, that person's sick, you know, or, or something versus this whole asymptomatic transmission issue that we're, that we're facing now. And I think if you go back and I go back every so often and look at my, uh, my email traffic and the th kind of things that we were talking about three weeks or a month ago, and it has really changed a lot even since then. So we've got to make sure that we continue to update the, update the guidance and, uh, that you know, people feel comfortable about flying. Uh, certainly a lot of it is based in the science, but a lot of it is also, I think, when you're talking about passengers in particular, it's based on their perception of, of whether it's safety, uh, safe from a public health uh, perspective. Uh, you can tell them all of the things about all the processes and everything that you're doing, but if they see that they're, you know, that somebody over the, you know, that uh, somebody that they're interacting with, you know, has a mask or a face covering on, that's something that, that's that's very tangible, and so these are the kinds of things that we'll to work with uh, the public health authorities to revise and get the latest and greatest information out there uh, as it becomes available. Yeah, and just a quick follow up on on the medical piece. Um, the FAA issued the, the for Part 135 um, operators a, a medical exemption for international uh, operations, right. and um, of course that was very very important to that community. So um, I was just wondering, are there any updates? Are there other relief types of um, exemptions maybe considered in the future moving forward? Yeah, well, the, uh, I, I mentioned this. Uh, in fact, I, my chief of staff just stuck her head in the door. Uh, we've been working on this uh, special federal aviation regulation that's got another, I think it's actually 23 items that plus or minus uh, in there that has a number of uh, additional uh, relief for uh, more for the general and business aviation community. I know it's been very important and it's been something that we have been working to address comprehensively. Uh, I can tell you that my, uh, my chief counsel was sending me drafts at two o'clock on Saturday morning and uh, it's 95 pages and very comprehensive. At least the last time I saw it, it was 95 pages. And um, so that had to go uh, it essentially progressed out of the agency over the weekend, and it's been under uh, interagency review ever since. And uh, as soon as we get off, uh, I'll probably be signing it hopefully before noon um, here. And, uh, and so it should be out shortly. But these are things like uh, 
extending uh, deadlines for recurrent training and medical, a lot of the same types of things that we've done in the Part 121 uh, air carrier community. Well, thank you, Steve. And I'm mindful of our time, but I've got a couple other questions if you're willing to stay for a few more sure. minutes. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, follow up on, on um, uh, you know, a crisis that when you came on board, you're dealing with, and that was the MAX, uh, 737 MAX uh, crisis. Um, could you provide us um, a, just a quick update on where we are? Is that still a priority, uh, you know, with everything else that's going on? Where, where do we stand on that? Well, it's a, it's a huge priority. And uh, just because it was, uh, I remember uh, Ali Barami came into my office uh, in first week of March and, uh, and I patted him on the shoulder and said, uh, well, it looks like uh, we never thought this would happen, but the max has actually been pushed below the fold here on the, uh, on the, on the front page of the paper here temporarily. And I never thought it would actually go way back into the business section, but that's, you know, that's, that's the, what we're dealing with with uh, with COVID-19. Um, but this is a great example of work that has to continue, even though it hasn't been necessarily top of mind. And some would some might think that uh, that the airplane is is you know the urgency uh, to to go through this rigorous process uh, is not there anymore. And I, it couldn't be further from the truth. It's it's still uh, extremely important that we do this right and uh, it's the airplane I'm committed that it's going to be the safest uh, commercial airplane out there flying it'll certainly be the most heavily scrutinized and I'm still going to be flying it myself at the appropriate time so the uh, there have been uh, a few issues with uh, with uh, uh, software getting the software system safety assessments all completed uh, but I expect that to happen and uh, in, in relatively short order. Our next big milestone is the certification flight. And uh, we still work very effectively with the international authorities, uh, EASA, Transport Canada, and uh, ANAC in Brazil. Uh, we're having dialogue with, uh, with China uh, as well, uh, because the uh, China market is very important uh, you know, to, to that airplane. And uh, so we will, you know, we're continuing to, uh, to move forward and uh, the wiring issue was a little bit, a uh, little bit of a challenge. But Boeing has a has a plan uh, to address that, and that will be part of the return to service work that's mm -hmm. done on the plane. The, the wiring separation uh, will be taken care of. So I'm I'm pleased with the progress that we have been making, and um, uh, the we're, we've got to get a little bit creative on how we're going to do the training scenarios. Uh, but we're working with the international authorities uh, on a contingency plan that may not require those uh, flight crews that are participating in the training scenarios. They may be able to use uh, Boeing training devices elsewhere in the world and may not have to travel into the U.S. So it doesn't look like that's going to be uh, a delay. And, uh, and we'll keep pushing forward and, and the process will take as long as it takes. Um, you know, we still don't have a timeline, but we are. We do continue to narrow the issues and uh, and deal with them uh, as they come up. So I'm, I'm very confident it's going to be a, a safe aircraft, but we've got to make sure that the job is done right. Good. Thank you for that update. Appreciate that. And, um, you know, as we finish up this segment this morning with you, again, thank you so much for, for participating. And I know your chief of staff wants you to move on to uh, your other appointments this morning. But um, maybe as um, you leave us uh, this morning, you know, if you could uh, maybe talk about one or two um, top um, safety and operational issues that you're concerned about, that you're working uh, as we go through this crisis and, and things on your mind. Um, yeah, that's great. It's a great point, um, Hassan. I think they're really the, uh, I think the loss of, of, uh, predictability and consistency is a is a risk to any any system, um, any safety system. So you you know as as operators, you know whether it's uh, the FAA operating the national airspace uh, or uh, you know uh, a pilot you know flying his airplane or an air carrier 
or a business, you know, with a flight department, whatever, wherever you are, uh, you want to be able to count on certain, you know, you're trained to be able to do things a certain way. And you can deal with contingencies like bad weather or, you know, an ILS being out or, or things like that. But we've got a whole new layer of, uh, of stress that's being added and unpredictability that's being added to the system. Uh, pilots flying to Midway on March 17th, the last thing they were thinking about was they would get there and the tower would be closed, right? So do we have, uh, you know, procedural operations to deal with that contingency? Well, yes, we do. But that's not an environment that we're, that we're normally uh, prepared for. So, uh, uh, and I think that this is a big reason why when I, I sat down with my aviation safety team in early March and we started looking at some of the events, you know, like this, we, we wanted, we've got to continue this dialogue and we are dealing with, uh, you know, a new, a new set of threats here. But the, I think the good news is the processes by which we share data, we share information, and we make decisions to mitigate those those threats um, and deal with those hazards. It's about safety management systems, and so we, we have a process that we that's kind of a uh, you know uh, something solid that we can grab onto. And and I think that we have to remember that. And uh, so there there are ways uh, to continue to to come together and and deal with these issues as as we identify them. I think beyond uh, you know so. Closely related to that is we've still got to move forward strategically. Um, you know, I had uh, big plans, and I still do, for the agency on things that we need to accomplish. And we're able to interact tactically a lot more effectively in this type of, of environment. But some of the strategic initiatives uh, that we had going, we've had to set off to the side because there's not really a good vehicle to to, to deal with those right now. And we need to make sure that we get back uh, to those without, with, and doing it in the right way, um, without it being another distraction that we have to deal with in the, in the day-to-day -day operations. So I would say those, those two are, you know, making sure that we continue to stay focused on safety. We have a way to do that process to do that. We're gonna have to get creative. And then we've still got to move forward strategically together on all the kinds of uh, things that we were talking about, for example, with, uh, with training earlier. Well, Steve, thank you so much. This this segment was absolutely informative and um, uh, and great updates on some of the initiatives um, on the part of the FAA. So thank you so much for spending this morning with us. On behalf of nearly 400 participants this morning, um, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, spend some time with us this morning. It was a pleasure. I always love to talk about flying and talk about safety. So uh, yeah. be safe and. Uh, Hopefully we'll see you. We'll see you soon in person, perhaps uh, soon. We hope so, sooner rather than later. Thank you, Son. Okay. Have a great day. All right. You too. Bye bye. Well, great. Um, well, Mark, can you uh, join me now? Um, and uh, let's move on Certainly. to the next segment of our program this morning. Um, Certainly. And before we do that, maybe just a, a quick uh, advice for the audience. Uh, and today, it's really important to hear from our audience. Um, I've just got a few short instructions, and they apply to all four webinar sessions over the two-day period. Number one, as we go through this session, we want to hear your thoughts, questions, and comments. So use the question box in your control panel. When we get to that part of each session, we'll use some of the questions we've received and get responses from our speakers. Uh, number two, we'll monitor the chat activity and reply as we're able to help you out if you're having technical problems. Um, there's always a chance you're not the only one. So um, even if we can't uh, assist you completely, it's nice to know whether or not there's some folks in the audience having uh, issues. Three, when we conduct polls, we'll be using a special link that allows you to participate with a separate mobile device or separate browser window and instant results are displayed on your webinar screen. So why don't we try that in terms of uh, at least a couple of polls? Um, and uh, I'll go to one that we've used uh, pretty regularly. Um, 
we're always interested in finding out, since we are a global organization, uh, where folks might be connecting from today as they're taking in the webinar. Um, there is a uh, web um, URL site, pollev.com slash majorwinds156. If you go to a separate window and uh, put that in a browser or from a mobile device, uh, you can participate by using that same URL. Um, and uh, just let us know um, where you're calling from uh, or connecting from. Uh, and you can see that the vast majority right now is from North America. Uh, I'll let and wait just a little bit before I uh, close this poll and move on. Uh, and uh, don't worry if you don't get a chance to uh, participate in this one. We've got uh, one or two more that we might uh, send your way and just uh, just after we're done with this one. So it looks like it's uh, stabilized um, a fair bit. I'm just gonna lock that and capture that so that we remember what it looked like. Um, and I'll move on to uh, another poll. This one, we'd like to know a little bit about who the stakeholders are. Um, you can answer more than once on this poll. Um, so uh, go ahead and uh, send us your replies to this poll. Looks like we've got a lot of folks that uh, are coming from uh, operators, either commercial or business, um, and their crew members. Um, and, uh, you know, the next biggest piece of that pie looks like it's, uh, uh, you know, more of a mix of other organizations. But it's good to see we've got a lot of folks that, uh, uh, you know, are, are working with operators. That's great, Mark. I'll, and I think that that's a great mix because our um, sessions are going to be really focused on operational issues, and it will be great to engage our audience um, on those. Um, so that that's that's great. Yeah, we'd like to see that. I'll lock that. I'll go to one more. This one is just sort of an interest um, in terms of what the audience knows about the NTSB, and that's one of the things that'll be coming up next. Um, we're gonna hear from uh, Dana Schultz in a little while about what the NTSB safety focus er areas are in general. Um, there are some uh, topics in here that apply to perhaps uh, folks in our audience, but uh, go ahead and uh, tell us what you believe is probably not gonna be on Dana's list. Um, and uh, we won't say anything right now in terms of what the correct answer is, You'll have to continue to participate in today's webinar uh, and hear it from Dana herself. So um, thank you very much. Um, I think you've been checked out and proficient on doing these polls. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get on to the uh, rest of our session. It is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Lisa Sassy. She is the chair of the Flight Safety Foundation Business Advisory Committee and CEO uh, for Flight Start Solutions. She has uh, served Flight Safety Foundation um, in many different ways over 20 years, and uh, she has led the BAC in so many different ways and helped us put together so many of our past uh, BASS events and highlight some very significant and impactful uh, safety issues. So Lisa, thanks for being here today. And we'd like you to tell us a little bit about um, the Business Advisory Committee and uh, get us going with our, our next speaker today. Well, before you do that, Lisa, I just uh, wanted to also personally welcome you and uh, thank you. also thank you for your leadership over the past few months in helping to work with the BAC to shape this program. And uh, thank you so much for that. I think uh, we have some fantastic uh, sessions planned for the next two days. And uh, so I'm gonna leave uh, you and Mark to it and I'll rejoin in just a little bit. So um, have a great thank session. You. Thank you. Well, good morning and welcome on behalf of the Flight Safety Foundation's Business Advisory Committee. 
Just a word about the BAC. The committee is comprised of very dedicated professionals that not only strive to collectively chart the course for business aviation, but execute their own safety practices every day. It's a privilege for the BAC to be a part of the Flight Safety Foundation's global charter for continuous safety and prevention. It's a forum for us to demonstrate our passion and assurance in the safety protocols that we embrace. It's a brave new world for all of us with many significant unknowns. As we begin to return to service, our concentration will need to be on small steps that will eventually create the environment that we're accustomed to and all of us are very proud of. It's a complex situation. The only way we can proceed is to consistently focus on the most important factor, which we know is safety. The continued focus on the foundation's existing guidance and interactions for prevention of lithium battery issues, BARS, GSIP, and others. We value the important relationships of the, the NBAA, ICAO, IATA, and many others that factor into this. We know aviation is resilient and always recovers. I trust the pontifical guidance that we share over the next two days will enhance the outstanding talent and experience that this audience typifies routinely. And with that, I join you with Dana Schultz. And I'll drop off, but I'll be helping with some of the questions and answers later on. Thank you, Mark. Dana, welcome. Dana's bio includes some history, which is very brief to her overall history, which is quite extensive. Dana Schultz, Director of the Office of Aviation Safety, has been with the National Transportation Safety Board since 2002. She began her career with the Safety Board as an Aircraft System Safety Engineer in the Aviation Engineering Division and serves as the group chairman and investigator on numerous major and domestic international and airline incidents, including Alaska Airlines Flight 261, Pinnacle Airlines Flight 3701, and American Airlines Flight 8587. In 2006, Ms. Schultz became Chief of the Aviation Engineering Division which is responsible for investigating the airworthiness of aircraft involved in major aviation accidents mm -hmm. and serious incidents. Ms. Schultz later served as the Chief of Major Investigations Division where she oversaw more than a dozen major airline investigations, including the investigation of US Airways 1549, which was in Weehawken, New Jersey as well as Colgan Airlines Flight 3407 in Clarence Center, New York, and subsequently Deputy <coughs> Director leading the organization's execution of air carrier investigations and safety initiatives, as well as the development of emergent programs for unmanned aircraft systems and commercial space accident investigation. Finally, in 2018, she was named the Acting Director of the Office of Aviation Safety and moved into this role recently in December of 2019. Please join me in welcoming Dana Schultz. Thank you, Lisa. And um, I wanna take a minute to, uh, to thank the Flight Safety Foundation and also to give you kudos for this virtual seminar. I think um, as the administrator and Hassan both mentioned, um, safety cannot take a break, and especially now, vigilance is key. So um, with that, I will chat a little bit about um, an update of what NTSB is doing um, in the current situation. And Lisa, I don't know if you had uh, my slides that, that uh, there we go. We'll start there. Um, and um, I think, are you going to uh, go ahead and advance those for me? I will do that for you, uh, okay. Dana. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so go ahead to the first slide and I'll 
sort of talk through what I what I thought I would do today is give everybody an overview of um, our status. Um, I don't know how many folks know uh, how much uh, the, the folks on online um, understand about NTSB. I know from the, the polling, it looked like um, there was some appreciation, but I uh, thought I would go through a quick overview, talk a little bit about the investigations we've recently completed, and then some of the more um, substantial ongoing investigations that we have. Talk a little about the safety focus areas. I know most wanted list showed up on the poll as well. So I'll talk a bit about that, particularly with regard to one part 135 safety. And then um, touch, uh, touch a bit on the COVID-19 situation, how it's impacting our operations um, and uh, talk a little bit about our launch responses. And then last, I thought I'd wrap up with a little bit of future look at the organizational focus, um, how we're looking internally within my office to understand how we can uh, essentially do our our safety work um, better for the communities that, that rely on that information. So next slide, Mark. So right now, um, the Office of Aviation Safety, I have 119 staff in the office. Um, we are in the process of recruiting, so we're hiring um, a number of technical positions, as well as the deputy director position of the office um, that position was a position that I vacated when I moved into the director role, so it's a pretty critical position. Um, but we're certainly moving ahead with, with the staff that we have right now. Um, and we have 86 investigators split between our regional operations and our headquarters operations. Um, and if you look at the, the map of the United States on the right, you'll see um, we have a very uh, distributed team of, of staff the, the regional offices in particular, a number of our investigators in, in today's world work remotely from their home. And so I think the good news for us in this COVID-19 situation is that we already had a very agile um, workforce that was enabled with technologies um, and processes to be able to do their work remotely. Um, I think we continue and we have been continuing over the last few years in particular to enhance our IT networks and infrastructure to be able to enable that. And so if anything, I think we'll come out of this crisis with a better clarity of how important that is to our operations, to sustaining continued operations. Um, the 37 headquarters staff right now, um, I'll talk a little bit about this in a bit, but um, we're all working full-time remote from our homes. So I'm coming to you from my, my home in, um, in Maryland. And um, it's so far working out very well. We're certainly open for business, just as the administrator mentioned, the FAA is. We, um, we continue to see um, our work um, come and unfortunately continue to see accidents. So in, in the US investigations, we do about 1300 new investigations and incidents a year. And um, of those, um, fortunately a vast majority of them are non-fatal, um, but they are uh, a significant part of our workload is understanding the causes of substantial damage as well as uh, serious injuries and then those that do result in fatalities. Um, we've, we did last year, we did about 222 launches. I think 10 of those were major launches with a board member on scene. The rest of them are mostly our regional investigative launches and uh, investigators, as I said, will launch right from their home to the scene of the accident. International work continues to be a big part of our portfolio. And um, as everybody probably is aware over the last year and a half with the 737 MAX accidents in Indonesia and Ethiopia, um, it, it really raises, um, I think, to light the importance of the role in the, uh, in the ICAO network of, of NTSB, um, as well as our partners at FAA and all of our um, US stakeholders that fly um, equipment overseas or that have manufactured equipment that flies overseas. So it's a huge part of our portfolio. We, um, in 2019, we received um, 311 notifications of that. We assigned about 250 on average um, of our investigators to serve as accredited representatives under Annex 13. Um, and we actually did launch full teams on two foreign um, launches in 2019. Next slide, Mark. Uh, next slide, Mark. It's coming up. Okay. It's just, <laughs> well, this is taking a little bit longer to respond yep. than I am. <laughs> no problem. No problem. 
Um, just real quickly, this year, um, I'll, I'll say in uh, 2019, um, we've co completed several reports, um, accident reports, in addition to the safety recommendation report that, that you see at the bottom. Um, the, the accidents were, were a, a broad span of aviation. We had two Part 121 accidents um, involving um, uh, uh, on-demand um, scheduled or on-demand 121 um, charter operation as well as Southwest Airlines um, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which unfortunately was one fatality. But we also had um, two Part 91 operations Trans-Pacific Trans involved a Part 91 repositioning flight in, of a Learjet um, near Teterboro, New Jersey, and then the, um, the uh, doors off uh, fly nigh on helicopter crash in the East River, New York in March um, with five fatal was a Part 91, defined as a Part 91 aerial photography flight. But um, I think for as much as we see the, the broad variation in operational segments within the aviation industry, um, unfortunately, uh, we often see some commonalities in accidents, and I'll talk about that in a minute with, uh, with some of the other safety focus work. So next slide, Mark. Coming. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Um, so the ongoing work that we have, um, I wanted to focus today on the Part 135 operations. I thought for the BAS discussion, this might be um, of the most interest to the folks on, on the phone or on the, the video conference. Um, so we've got four, these by far are not all of the accidents we've had so far in, in um, certainly in 2020. The chart on the right shows you um, basic trend. I, I think the caveat I would add is that um, those, the data that you see um, for the most part, uh, you know, fortunately we're dealing with relatively small numbers. So doing statistical comparisons um, is not really the way we typically look at the data, but we really look um, fundamentally at the safety issues involved. And in, in this case, um, we've got uh, these four accidents that really involve um, uh, a high fatality count. Um, we've got the air ambulance accident near Zaleski, Ohio. So helicopter air ambulance operations are something that we've looked at in the past. Um, safety risk, uh, operational safety risk assessments before um, launching on these on-demand flights, uh, certainly flights that are very critical to saving lives, um, but at the same token, the risks that sometimes get taken um, far exceed the, the capabilities um, that, that folks anticipated, and we see accidents, in this case a fatal accident. I'll mention that this particular case um, we are also moving towards the virtual world and trying to complete our work um, as we normally do in this current circumstance. We're going to be doing a virtual board meeting on um, May 19th for the Celeste, Ohio case. So we're gearing up for that right now, and um, the draft report is, is, is in work for that. Um, we also have um, an air tour mid-air collision in Ketchikan, Alaska that we're investigating. That was a six fatal event, um, looking at a lot of factors with regard to um, VFR operations in, in air tour, dense, denser air tour um, locations. But Alaska has obviously some very unique challenges with regard to terrain and weather. Um, we've got a helicopter air accident tour in Lahui, Hawaii as well. That was seven fatal in December. That uh, that is something that we're looking at um, in great detail. And then, of course, the last accident in January of this year, the um, helicopter collision with terrain in Calabasas, California. Um, that's also a case that we're hoping to move ahead quickly to get uh, a final report out in the coming year. Next slide, Mark. So I talked about earlier the safety focus areas, and I think um, as many of you are probably aware, um, we elected as we started the year in 2019 to add part 135 flight operational safety improvement to our most wanted list as a aviation centric focus. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we see and, and uh, certainly helicopter operations have maybe some unique um, risks that they face, challenges, hazards, um, compared to fixed wing operations, but nonetheless, we still see some common themes. And I think um, failure, non-compliance with standard operating procedures, 
um, perhaps incomplete or ineffective operating procedures, standard operating procedures. Um, these are things that we see on a, on a unfortunately more common basis than we'd like. And so mm. the first two recommendations uh, or first two safety issue areas, which are framed underpinned by NTSB safety recommendations really are geared towards addressing those issues. And I think, um, you know, the safety management systems in particular really trying to build that culture of ensuring that safety gets the same um, consideration and attention as operational performance. And um, I think a lot, of, a lot of organizations wanna get there, but they don't really know how. And I think the safety management system structured approach is a mechanism to do that. I know that a lot of organizations are looking at how to scale SMS for um, smaller operators, many of whom only have you know, a handful of aircraft. Um, we believe that that can be done and we're very motivated to help uh, provide data or more detailed information about the accidents that we've investigated in order to help facilitate that work. But we think it's really critical. Um, it's really, I believe, uh, personally, what's really changed um, up the game um, for the, the entire 121 community is this, um, this structured way of doing business. Um, and it has a way of raising the bar for everybody. Peer pressure, it's a way to apply peer pressure in a, in a very professional way, but to get the industry up to speed, um, up to you know, raise the bar, so to speak. And of course, right. flight data monitoring being a big part of that as well. Um, we believe that in part when operations are monitored more precisely, um, more regularly, that you can see trends away from crews following standard operating procedures, but you can also see where perhaps SOPs are maybe not um, complete if you start looking at occurrences and you start looking closer at your procedures. Um, and then lastly, CFIT avoidance training. Um, I think that uh, equipage of, of, of aircraft is equally as important, but we often see that um, operators think they have been doing training, um, but they're not really getting the effectiveness out of it. And again, um, through better operational monitoring, there's some degree of ability to, to also look closely at those training programs. Um, the other items there, the other safe, safety focus areas are, are, are also on our most wanted list for uh, 2019 through this year. Um, they are more multimodal. So um, as some of you may or may not know, NTSB is a multimodal accident investigation agency. So we look at um, not just aviation, but we look at highway, rail, pipeline, hazardous material, marine accidents. And so we see anywhere the humans involved, things like fatigue, distraction, you know, the alcohol and drug impairment. And then of course, also occupant protection becomes critically important. So those are our focus areas. Um, I think if you want more information on this, um, you can certainly reach out to me. Um, and I think Lisa has my email address, but, um, but also look at ntsb.gov. We have um, all of the uh, fact sheets right on our website. So next slide, Mark. So I'll talk little here about this COVID-19 impact on us. And um, I'll start off by saying that we are absolutely um, in business doing our, our, our job of accident investigation, serious incident investigation. But very quickly um, in mid-March, when um, things started to happen very, very quickly with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the declaration by the World Health Organization, and then subsequently the travel restrictions that were recommended um, by the administration and, and, and really um, trickled down to the local municipalities, states. Um, we really um, began this restricted travel um, high bar approach. We are um, evaluating accident events case by case to understand um, a bit about the risk that we would take on by sending staff to the scene. You know, not just, um, we, we deal with the, the, um, the risk of um, the, the need for personal protective equipment due to human remains and things like that all the time in our job, but logistical issues like travel, getting there, um, flights on the commercial airlines, going through airports, 
um, basic logistic challenges of knowing um, when we get to a location that's a remote scene, are we going to be able to get hotels? Are our investigators going to be able to eat? Um, those are very practical challenges that we have to deal with. And so we've we've partnered a bit with FEMA um, through our response operations center, which you see a picture of at the right there, to um, to try to help us size up on a case by case basis what type of local risks we might fight, face if we launched investigators. And we're, of course, always balancing that against the safety risk to the public. What do the preliminary circumstances of the accident, the facts that we gather, um, you know, what are they telling us about the risk? Is there a broader airworthiness risk um, that needs to be addressed now? So we're, we're balancing all that, as I say, on a case-by-case -case basis. And then we're also restricting travel from the follow-up work standpoint. Um, we do a lot of our work on scene at the accident. But frankly, a lot more of our work requires us to do follow-up after we get back from the scene. And that requires travel typically to um, manufacturer facilities, maybe operator facilities, um, travel to do examinations, engine tests, things of that nature. And so much, there are a number of cases that have been, um, we're, we're working around the fringes as much as we can to get as much done as we can in a desk investigation type approach, but there's going to be some limitations to that. Um, the other impact I would say, and we have reached out and spoken with some of our typical party um, party stakeholders um, and, and folks that would serve as technical advisors to us on international investigations, to really talk a bit about this, this protocol for launch planning um, and on-scene work as well as follow-up work. You know, if we get into this situation, and we have had a couple since we started the restricted uh, COVID-19 mitigations, where um, we felt that given the significance of the event, we wanted to make sure that some level of lab examination occurred. And so we applied social distancing practices, which might mean that the parties are not there with us like they normally would be in our lab. Um, but we web conference with them, we, we video conference with them, maybe live while the metal, metallurgist is actually looking at the, the components so that they can see it on the webcam and we can talk it through. But we do these things to prevent any um, heightened risk of exposure to our staff as well as to the staff of the parties. Um, so access is going to be limited if we do get into a launch situation, but again, the bar is going to be very high. It's going to have to be the type of accident that suggests very broad exposure of the public to, to risk. Um, so what we are doing though is quite substantial and I feel like every day, um, I don't think I can compete with the administrator. I don't think I've done 18 Zoom meetings in one day, uh, but we use Microsoft GoToMeetings. It's been, it's been um, going very well for us. Our teams like it. Again, fortunately, because we already had a very remote workforce, um, we were really well schooled on it. It did not take much to get the rest of our staff up to speed on using that technology. Um, we also are doing a lot of um, investigative work at our desk, which again, isn't the optimal way to, um, to really get the facts quickly and efficiently and to document them for the purposes of publicly disseminate, disseminating them. But, um, we are able to get things like radar data, radar communications, um, or uh, air traffic controller communications, um, pilot records, uh, you know, those sorts of things without going to the scene of the accident. Um, we're also able to coordinate with on-scene uh, local uh, responders, first responders, to help us do site documentation, um, local police. Um, but I'd also like to put out a really big thank you to the FAA because we always work in partnership with our, um, our colleagues in the Flight Standards District offices, the FISDO inspectors, to help us on scene at remote locations um, where there is a FISDO within driving distance. Um, it really can help leverage um, the limited resources that we have. As I mentioned, I only have 86 investigators, and of that in the regions, we've got 49. Um, and with 1,300 new cases a year, it, it's impossible for us to launch the scene of every accident. But the FISDOs really help us out, and they have really helped us substantially here um, in the cases that we've seen. I think we're up to 
last I counted, I think last night, maybe 16 accidents that we might ordinarily have launched to, but we did not because of the COVID-19 crisis. And I think in most, all but maybe one or two, local FISDA was able to help us. And then lastly, as I mentioned, virtual board meetings. Um, we had one yesterday with our Marine organization, our Office of Marine Safety did a live um, virtual board meeting with our five board members, Chairman Sumwalt, Vice Chairman Landsberg, and our other three board members um, to review that report and approve it. So um, that's also been a very successful way to conduct our business um, in these days of social distancing. Mark, next slide, Mark. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit uh, real quickly. I mentioned it a bit, but you know, our process uh, is what you see here uh, in a normal circumstance for an accident. We go to the scene, we do our follow-up investigative work with the parties, and then we get to this public docket phase, which is where um, we've done all of this work in concert with the parties to do our fact gathering. And now we're going to um, essentially get everybody to review that factual documentation, uh, sign off that it's complete and that it's accurate. Um, and then we're gonna release it publicly in a docket along with a cockpit voice recorder if there's one available in that particular accident. Um, we may progress to a public hearing. So if we do that, those two activities, the docket release and the hearing occur concurrently, um, but not all accidents have a public hearing um, or an investigative hearing as we call them nowadays. Um, and then finally our board meeting and final report so, but in these days uh, with COVID-19, as I mentioned, the on-scene work being um, really constrained and that we're evaluating that on a case-by-case -case basis for the most substantial risk um, being the ones that we would do limited um, travel uh, and limited groups and parties. Uh, we would still try to do some of the, the other um, communication mechanisms that we use to communicate with the parties and the stakeholders involved, like the progress meetings, um, perhaps media briefings by virtual um, virtual meetings um, and press releases and such. Um, but it's that follow-on investigation that I wanted to mention in, in this because um, right now, I think I also checked yesterday, I think we had about 96 discrete travel events that we um, have now postponed uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis. And so, as I mentioned, we're still working with the manufacturers, with the operators, with the involved parties to gather the information we need to pursue and follow the investigation through to this final report. But there are gonna be certain cases where um, we really do need to um, examine a system or a component or even test an engine and so there may be some impacts to that follow on work, how soon a docket's available, how soon the final report is available. Um, we continue to size that up. I do that with my team weekly and, um, and look at alternatives for completing the work. But, um, but I think as we go through this, um, we are gonna see some potential impact on, um, on the reports. Um, we're working very hard, though, to prevent that because we know how important that information is to the stakeholder community. So next slide, Mark. Uh, and yeah, and so this is some of the numbers. So uh, it's actually 93 follow-up exams that, that we have um, potentially postponed. Um, I mentioned the lab work, uh, the social distancing is warranted. Um, you know, I'll, I'll mention one other um, one other. Uh, challenge that we face. And um, I mentioned this with um, some high level of sensitivity because I, um, I know that the industry itself is really struggling right now financially because of the impacts of, of you know, decommissioning, you know, a high percentage of, of the operations. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we're seeing a number of manufacturers who are um, going through voluntary and or mandatory furloughs for their staff. So for us at NTSB, we rely on this party process. And I mentioned parties. Um, what the party process really enables is those stakeholders that have employees involved in the accident or equipment um, to participate in the fact gathering with us. We wanna make sure that we get the comprehensive set of facts needed to best analyze 
the safety issues involved and, and the cause of the accident. But if those parties aren't available because, you know, in this very extraordinary time, uh, they're furloughed, um, that can also delay, delay the work. So we're working um, very ardently with those folks and I know that they are doing the same with us. Um, we have a very good relationship with our colleagues at the various manufacturers and, and many of the bigger operators that we work with on a more routine basis. And they're doing an, an, an outstanding job. I mentioned kudos to the FAA, um, but we recognize that the system strained. So we're trying to work as much as we can um, to prevent any further strain on the system. So I wanna thank everybody that has been participating and helping us, so. Um, in addition to, uh, and, and that's fine, Mark, you can leave it there. Um, so, and I'll last end that by saying that in, in addition to, um, you know, working around the fringes on the new, inf the new accidents have a, that have occurred to gather the right data and continue to proceed, make sure that the, the, the investigative work is progressing. Um, we're also working on a lot of other backlog work that we haven't been able to get to um, because of all of the new accident investigations that come in the door. Um, and so uh, on that front, we've made a lot of progress at closing out some of the investigations that had gotten far enough into the fact gathering um, that we could start writing the final report and actually release it. Um, so we're absolutely staying gainfully employed and I know my days seem to be busier than ever right now with this situation. I'll, I'll end. Uh, switching topics very quickly to more of an internal focus. I mentioned the external safety focus we have with regard to safety issues in the industry based on the accidents that we've seen. But organizationally, as I stepped into this role, it was pretty clear to me um, that uh, it, it, we might benefit from looking closer at our processes and how we're doing our work. And specifically right now, um, we have about 2,100 cases open overall. This would be backlog cases in addition to all the case, new cases that we've taken on as of you know, April 29th. And um, with you know, 86 investigators, that's about 24 cases per person. And, and many of these cases are, um, are cases that, as I said, fortunately do not involve fatalities. They're not uh, complex in a large sense, but many of them are. And so unfortunately, um, that means that we have um, really, uh, in my mind, an unsustainable approach to keeping our ability to, to uh, complete reports in a timely fashion while maintaining the quality. And so I really wanted to focus on process, better business process management, look at the processes, can we use some of the practices that I know many of the listeners who are out there probably are familiar with, with regard to Lean Six Sigma, um, to try to reduce the variation in our processes, try to um, reduce how much rework we're doing, um, non-value added tasks, you know, why are we doing things that way? Um, is it really adding value to, to the mission product, which is probable cause, identifying safety issues timely and making sure actions taken to prevent future accidents. That's really where we get the biggest bang for the buck. And uh, in government, it's sometimes difficult <laughs> because um, you know, we do have a fair amount of um, tasking that's required by law that's more administrative in nature. But I really wanted to focus on this um, within the office and then also make uh, the agency leadership aware of this so that we can get better tools and and relief perhaps where we need it so that we're really focusing on enhancing the efficiency of the operation for the stakeholders. Um, so we're focusing on quality and timeliness. Those are the two outcomes we wanna get from this. We're looking very closely at our processes, doing things like process mapping. Um, we've identified opportunities for standard work, uh, obviously, uh, particularly in the general aviation sector. Unfortunately, we do have repetitive nature type accidents. We've got, as, as many know, we've had a lot of loss of control accidents. We've had, um, we've had a lot of um, CFIT occurrences. And I mentioned some of the safety actions we're taking, but looking inwardly, 
are our reports really identifying the key issues that we need to be identifying to get to the next step of safety? Um, so we really want to see some standard practices when we when we encounter an accident that has some similarities with prior accidents. Um, are we really focusing on the type of work that needs to be done, not doing more than needs to be done, but doing exactly what needs to be done so that we can get there faster with high quality? Um, we're looking at work planning to try to help um, improve that. So very early and recurrent um, detailed work planning and scope discussions based on what I'll say are return on investment factors. Um, again, what's going to get us to probable cause, what's going to get us to safety quickest, um, more precise safety action that the industry can take. Um, and then employee engagement. This is a culture piece for us, just like um, all the operators that are listening out there and the manufacturers um, and FAA as well have to, have to achieve. We also have to achieve a culture um, that looks at getting uh, you know, operational efficiency and, uh, and quality out there quickly. So lastly, some of the things we're doing, we're actually um, working on some um, data-driven performance monitoring capabilities. So we're enhancing our data systems. In aviation, we've been very lucky at the NTSB because since the NTSB has a mandate to investigate every civil aviation accident, we have had a database since I think 1962, we've been tracking data. Um, and so uh, our other modes of transportation within uh, other modes uh, within NTSB that investigate other modes of transportation did not. So now they do. It's a tool called safety and uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably blank on that acronym, but I think it's uh, safety analysis for transportation infrastructure or something like that. <laughs> but um, it's now our safety uh, data system and aviation is migrating in the next uh, few weeks, hopefully uh, maybe within the next month. Um, so we're hoping to have better query tools for us internally to aggregate data, look more precisely, um, you know, peel the onion back in an aggregated fashion, but also for you, for everyone out there, for the public, better tools to be able to query our data system and look for what you need by uh, perhaps safety issue area, which you cannot do today very easily with our, um, our website. Probably most importantly for me though is staff resources. Um, we have some very talented analysts, but um, we're looking at how we can enhance our um, our uh, human capital structure to be able to really optimize our business process management. So um, that's a little bit about where we're headed in the Office of Aviation Safety. Um, my goal is to get um, basically reports out to you, um, stakeholders, the public as quickly as possible, um, but making sure that we get the safety information that you need to make it fully value added. So. Um, I want to thank you again, Lisa um, and Mark and Hassan, for inviting me to participate in this first virtual um, webinar. And I want to thank everybody out there for your, um, your vigilance, your continued vigilance um, to safety and, uh, and for, for tuning in. Great, Dana, thank you. You're certainly not a stranger to the foundation and the NTSB has had interaction with us for many, many years. Um, I know that, um, that we just have a few minutes for questions, but if I can uh, start out, and of course my background has been helicopters uh, long ago, so that is something that's dear to my heart, but I noticed in your presentation that the fatal part 135 accidents seem to be dominated by helicopter operations. Are there safety issues uh, unique to those operations, or is, a co is there a common thread across all business aviation, fixed wing, helicopters alike? So that's a great question. And I think, uh, Lisa, you're very expert in, in this area with helicopters, so you know the unique risks that, that are associated with the, the type of flying that helicopters do, um, particularly mm -hmm. the weather um, and the inadvertent IMC. Um, challenge. And I think um, while that, you know, I, I don't know about the numbers, uh, while that may end up being a, a risk that, that helicopter operators encounter more often, I think the bottom line is we've seen it with fixed wing as well. Mm. The secret avoidance training um, and the equipage. Yeah. Um, but, you know, also um, 
We've seen a number of accidents involving spatial disorientation as a result. And I think reinforcing that cultural risk um, assessment approach to, um, and again, this, this gets back to SMS, is helping pilots um, and even operators understand that um, even though they've done it a hundred times, mm -hmm. the next one could be the one that, uh, that doesn't go as planned. You, you need to really understand what the risks are and proactively manage them. So I would say very common issues, um, maybe the operational environment can be unique and different, but you know, the, uh, the SOP compliance and the, the risk management are still key with FDM. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, maybe one more from me and then we'll go to, to the audience questions. Um, you alluded to drone operations. Um, of course, it's emerging and we all have interest in that. At current time, it doesn't seem to be interacting with us all that much, but of course, in the future it will. So what involvement has the NTSB had with the drone industry and what directions are you taking for the future? Yeah, so um, we started our engagement with the drone world in back in 2006. That was the first accident investigation we conducted. It was a uh, actually a Customs and Border Protection public aircraft operation of a um, uh, a drone out in uh, I think it was near New Gallus, Arizona. And uh, very quickly we realized that um, this was going to be, even though at the time it's an operation that's far overwhelmed now by a really small UAS. That was a Predator uh, drone, which is very large, but today's world we're seeing small ones. But nonetheless, we realized that we were really going to have to learn to adapt. Um, those are aircraft as well. Um, and so in 2010, we actually modified our rules, our regulations. We, came, we included um, UAS in our definition of an accident. Mm -hmm. We have um, a focal expert within the board who has helped me get in place standard operating procedures for how we investigate drone accidents. Um, okay. But I think as you see us in the future where we're gonna head is really focused mostly on the commercial drone operations. And there are a lot of those spooling up and I think folks may have seen in the advent of the COVID-19 crisis that um, some operators are already using drones to deliver medications to, uh, to certain areas. Okay, perfect, thank you. Mark, do we have audience questions? Yes, um, but, but we probably can only take one uh, given the time we're at um, in terms of uh, the uh, webinar today. Uh, and this one is on, uh, and I'm sorry, the slides advanced, uh, uh, got a little sensitivity on my mouse, um, but, uh, there's a question that's coming in about uh, just the general receptivity that the FAA has on NTSB recommendations. Can you comment on that, uh, on how well those recommendations, uh, you know, are getting carried out? Sure, I can. I can comment. I think um, so. A couple things. Uh, we generally quote that about 80% of our recommendations are successfully adopted. Um, and of that, a vast majority of our recommendations are directed to FAA. Um, so that I think is reasonable in the sense that uh, if they're taking everything we say without some type of a, a balanced approach, maybe that would be uh, questionable. So we understand that. I think the challenge in today's world for them though, and it's certainly something that we're looking at and have adapted our approach to recommendations to, to go more directly to the end user, which are you all, um, that are not FAA um, regulator, you're the, the actual front line, um, is the fact that regulations in general are not something that um, are easy to get through in today's world. Mm -hmm. While we think they're an important facet of safety because uh, there does have to be, um, in some cases where there's not voluntary compliance, there needs to be a standard that that's set and we think the FAA is, is the organization to do it. But I think the, the reality is in today's world, we make recommendations uh, often directly to the end user, to the manufacturers, um, to the operators, because we know you're in the front seat. You're the ones who really are improving safety and have the best unilateral opportunity to do that. So that's what we're doing today. 
So I would say overall, um, we have fairly good receptivity on the part of the FAA, but um, but we think because of the limitations of the regulatory world we're in today, um, that going to the to the frontline folks is the best way to do it, and we do that often now. Great, thank you. So I would like to ask, and I assume that this is something that you um, stated in the beginning. I'd like there to be an open forum and communication from the audience to you. Uh, Dana, if you would be willing to do that, I'm sure the foundation can share your, your email address at some point. Um, would that be okay? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. And then just before we, we thank uh, Dana, I would also like to encourage those of you who are interested, there are fabulous courses of investigation with the NTSB that engage corporate operators. I would encourage you to take a look at the website and if they interest you to, to certainly get involved in those. Dana, thank you so much for your time today. We greatly appreciate it and we look forward to you joining us in the future. Great, well, thank you very much and thank you to everyone that participated as well. Be safe thank and healthy. You. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. At this point, we'd like to turn the uh, program back over to Dr. Hassan Shahidi. Thank you so much, Lisa. Hassan will be on just a second here, I'm sure. Uh, we really appreciated you and uh, Dana and that session with the NTSB. Yeah, I thought um, that that was absolutely informative. Um, it was comprehensive and it just really uh, was educational in terms of the, the depth and breadth of the portfolio. Um, uh, really, that's undertaken by NTSB and the processes. So um, they're very good. We do have one more thing on the agenda, so we would like to move on um, to a F Business Aviation Meritorious Service Award. And Hassan, would you like to introduce this and uh, talk a little bit about what's this award all about? Certainly. Well, uh, the Fly Safety Foundation Business Aviation Meritorious Service Award, it's a mouthful, um, has been presented by the foundation since 1975, so a long time. And this is for outstanding service and contributions to corporate aviation safety. And we um, typically present these um, and we have at our BASS events. Uh, the award recognizes individuals whose work uh, enhances safety and, uh, for this segment of the industry. Um, and the recipients, as you can see here over the years, have included industry leaders, have included um, government uh, officials, members of the news media even, researchers, um, whose findings uh, especially are relevant to corporate aviation. And um, this year, we've um, wanted, even with our virtual BAS, to, to continue with that tradition to recognize these types of contributions, and we have received a number of excellent nominations this year. And we've gone through our process for select, uh, selecting the, the, the awardee for this year. And uh, so um, the foundation is very pleased to announce this year's winner, James Albright. Um, and I think he is very well known to the community uh, for um, his dedication and service over the years. Um, <clears throat> there is a, um, an, a, an actual award that will be um, uh, given to him, um, and I'll just read some of, of the citation uh, in, the, in the award, um, but I won't read it all. But um, for Jim, for his tireless advocacy, advancing safety in business aviation through code7700.com website, I think many of you are familiar with that. Um, the um, flight lesson series of books, um, magazine articles, and numerous lectures and seminars over the many, many years. Jim is the, the, um, has had a, a comprehensive um, online um, resource for the business aviation community um, and um, uh, 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 to gain accurate and, and detailed technical knowledge about flight operations, safety, compliance, uh, and and uh, all of that um, for free free of cost to the community. And uh, as I mentioned, he's the author of the the um, flight lessons series of books, um, collections of hundreds of professional pilot 
procedures and techniques. Um, so I won't read the rest of the citation um, other than to say that the Flight City Foundation is honored to present the Meritorious Service Award to Jim Albright this year. And I think all of the participants and all of you would agree that he is definitely worthy of this award this year. And we congratulate him. Now, um, as it turns out, uh, Jim is flying as we speak th today. So he could not actually be um, with us um, live on this webinar, um, but he has uh, provided us a, um, a video message. Uh, I think he recorded it yesterday or last night, and uh, we're gonna show it in just a little bit. And perhaps Mark, if we're able to contact him, maybe between today and tomorrow, maybe he'll uh, join us and say hello. But, um, but now I believe we can just uh, share his video. Yeah, that'll be nice to have him with us. Uh, so we do have a video. It's very short, 30 seconds. Um, we know it's got a little bit uh, lighter volume level. So you might want to be ready to just uh, crank up your own volume on your end, uh, just so you can hear uh, what James had to say. Hello, virtually, of course, these days. Thank you very much for this honor. It means quite a bit to me. I've been a consumer of Flight Safety Foundation Intel since the very first approach and landing accident reduction toolkit was printed so many years ago. And that continues. I was urging something about the landing fair just the other day using Flight Safety Foundation material. We share a common goal, you and I. This Meritorious Service Award further fires my passion for that. And for that, I say thank you very much. Well, it's nice to have a video from him and we'll, we will be in touch with him. Let's see if we can't at least hear from him in one of our future sessions. Yeah, I know he's um, en route um, as we speak today. So uh, perhaps uh, if he's able to join or contact us, we'll try to, we'll try to say hello to him uh, between now and tomorrow, possibly. Good. All right. Well, we do have a few other people to thank. Uh, we have uh, several sponsors. Uh, that have uh, helped us out in this event, uh, Air Care International, Gulfstream, uh, Quality Resources, LLC, uh, Advanced Aircrew Academy, uh, Polo Polaris Aero, and uh, the whole uh, event uh, is being done in partnership with the NBAA. So we're very appreciative uh, of all our sponsors. Absolutely. Then lastly, yeah. you know, um, uh, during our normal um, bass events, of course, you know, we have a broader participation uh, and physical participation and we have exhibitors and, and uh, sponsors and they, of course, always help to put these kinds of programs together and uh, this sponsorship certainly uh, helping us um, with this, this year's event. Well, lastly, we do want to remind you that there are three more sessions that we'll be doing. Um, the next one starts just this afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be talking a little bit about the aviation medical community perspective. Uh, but we'll follow that tomorrow with two sessions, again at 9.30, um, returning to normal, what is next, uh, and uh, session four at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, April 30th, uh, looking beyond this uh, COVID-19 crisis and what's in the future uh, after the crisis passes. So if you haven't registered for those events, you can certainly do that at flightsafety.org slash events. So once again, we thank you be for being with us uh, and we'll see you at two o'clock. Take care.